Hi, I'm Jason Camelot. Thank you, Ruth Panofsky, for this beautiful book, The New Spice Box. It's a real honor, joy, really, to be in this book among so many other writers whose work I admire. I'm going to read uh, the two poems that appear in this book, and then I'll read a few other poems uh, that are on Jewish themes that I've written over the years. So the two that were selected for the new Spice Box are from my collection, What the World Said. And I'll say more about that book soon, but um, a lot of these poems are written from the perspective of someone who knows a little bit about Judaism, but not an enormous amount. But, it's, but the, the speaker in these poems is, is trying, is interested, needs to know more. This one's called Distinctions. This morning I was the one who sang the loudest. I sang most ferociously my gratitude for the ability to make rudimentary distinctions, such as between day and night, Gentile and Jew, slave and free man, man and woman, naked and clothed bound and released, bent and upright, earth and water, needful and satisfied, but not finer distinctions. It was early, my eyes still bleary, as between plastic and rubber, muffins and cupcakes, whiskey and bourbon, Velveeta and cheese, sorrow and despair, dread and foreboding, mud and muck, pepperoni and carnotzel, pure anger and undiluted rage, life and death. I cried to myself as I sang because you would have loved to hear me sing. I sang out loud to turn my sadness into strangeness. I cried within because of distinctions between bound and released, forbidden and allowed. The second poem that was selected for this collection is uh, a poem called Etrog. It's a poem about a fruit, uh, and it's based on uh, a famous poem by William Carlos Williams that's also based on a fruit, but a different fruit. In that case, it's a plum. Etrog. This is to inform you I ate the etrog you left on the kitchen table. It smelled like an exotic, scentless candy. I could not resist peeling it and putting it into my mouth. It is a strange, unpleasant fruit. It tastes like shame. I was unaware one does not eat the etrog, but there's no chance I will repeat this ignorant act. I will never eat an etrog again. So those two poems were the ones that were selected for the anthology. Uh, they come from this book, What the World Said. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it was published by Mansfield Press in 2013. Uh, I began writing the poems for that collection soon after my father passed away, and as I embarked upon saying Kaddish for him for the next 11 months, uh, the poems are written from the perspective of someone who is ignorant in a way of the rituals that he is engaging in, but um, also someone who's interested in trying to understand and trying to find meaning in those rituals for himself or for himself in relation to his lost father. The first one I'm going to read is called 31 Awakenings. Awake to tang of skunks and ashamed dogs. Awake again to mumble to the name. Awake to talit troubadours in song. Awake to snappy sacred melodies. Awake to frantic cell phone shuddering. Awake to Canaanite head vibrations. Awake to expired tickets for the day. Awake to persuasive chemical woe. 
Awake to strange hotel rooms in your home. Awake to slip your pants onto your arms. Awake to ghosts with condescending smiles. Awake to blips of sociopathic birds. Awake to warring sparrows stabbing robins. Awake to loss of words and cloying hum. Awake to late onset aphasia. Awake to dollar store radio zaps. Awake to partial feeling in your tongue. Awake to find the medicine cabinet gone. Awake with allergies to skin and air. Awake to sense your toothpaste tube feels pain. Awake to feel your razor blades are teeth. Awake to indecision about shoes. Awake to dress in someone else's clothes. Awake because that's what a good son does. Awake to see your windows are mirrors. Awake to visions of barren fields. Awake to pop three tiny cupcakes. Awake to slouch with coffee on your stoop. Awake to disgusting longing. Awake to synonyms for praise, exalt, extol. Awake to say old words resoundingly. Uh, the next Kaddish poem I'm going to read is from a different section of the book. It's, it's a section with this title. And uh, it's written more in a kind of comic, grotesque mode. Uh, you don't always say Kaddish at home. Sometimes you have to go to foreign places. In this case, the, the shul is very foreign, very unwelcoming. Um, and it's about, in a sense, trying to fulfill your, your duty and find your, your space for saying Kaddish uh, in the most uh, bizarre and eerie of environments. It's called At the Shmagegi Minion. Um, and maybe I should give a warning. There are some um, bad Yiddish words in it. At the Shmagegi Minion. At the Meshugana Nebesh Nudnik Minion this morning, I found a pubic hair in my sitter, and I'm telling myself it was a beard hair. The service was discovered beneath a garbage marked stairwell behind a red door tagged in black with the graffiti Siggy Dibbuk. When I arrived, a morbid man named Azazel greeted me from behind a table of crumpled circulars. He wore a goat-soiled jacket and tarnished baseball cap. He told me I was early, although I was on time, and he listed all the other minions I could have attended had I not come to this fetid basement of grape-juice-stained tables, chugged dry vishnik bottles, and cat-piss-burning menorah. The coffee I made while I was waiting was a ground, drill-bit blend. The sugar was granulated tooth enamel, plastic spoon from a shredded paper sack. I held my nose for 45 minutes until the rabbi came, and then the minion materialized like ten deformed gullums from beneath the benches, from behind the radiator, from the corner cocoons of 1932 dust pillows and human felt. The greasy-haired minion, the slow-witted minion, the indiscriminate, voluble, excessively oi saying minion simply emerged and stood silent except for oi during slichot, stood dumb for tefillah as the rabbi writhed on the bima in fierce prayer as I read responsively for this lobotomized, lobotomized minion of inner-city shlemils who were oying at the least appropriate times plucking pubes from within their pants and leaving these black curled bookmarks like floating pays and samachs randomly between pages of sacred Assyrian script. And then the Shmagegi minion dissolved into yellow vapor upon the termination of my final Kaddish, and nothing but the unsanitary smell of Schmendrick Schlong and Yatschmutz remained. I'm going to close with um, the title poem of the last section of the book. I tried to find you in Gehenna. This last section is really about that period of grief and loss when you feel the other person sort of walking beside you um, and turn and don't see them there. It's about uh, a hope for 
a kind of foggy space in which you might catch a glimpse of the person you love and have lost. And this poem, which is based on sort of apocryphal writings about Gehenna, which is kind of like the Jewish limbo. It's kind of like the space where the soul perhaps resides um, as it's ascending to heaven through the Kaddish uh, period as the prayers help lift the soul up. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's both a, a place you don't want to be, but also a place that's in between. And so a place that evokes the possibility of those left behind actually being able to perhaps see the lost person one last time. I tried to find you in Gehenna. It is a place one should not think about where trees appear withered and all leaves are stripped with certain exceptions. Where women give birth to giants and then shun them. And that is why giants are angry, even the ones that started out kind. I drafted a petition to be allowed in, but the souls were too busy complaining and supplicating to sign it. Sons are not permitted entry on weekends. I tried to find you in Gehenna, but I grew distracted by the burning fire and how it could make itself look like baby Elvis when it wished. I tried to find you in Gehenna, where winds are kept in rows waiting to adorn asphalt roofs with ashes to blow cement foundations clear of death. I tried to find you in Gehenna, a place where nothing is made, but where stars are duct taped to metal chairs until post game. I tried to find you in Gehenna to add my complaints to those of the sons of men who are dead and send them off to heaven in a rubber band helicopter. I tried to find you in Gehenna where eat no food and never thirst are rules to be observed and where no one is ever observed. I tried to find you in Gehenna, but the deaths of giants with formidable souls stuck beneath mammoth bodies obstructed me. I tried to find you in Gehenna, but fell into a smooth cocoon-like hole that was empty with my thinking, but could not see past the blessed land so full of juicy fruit trees. At gate 87, past fragrant Cinnabon and Pepper, I heard your name called for final boarding, but it was someone else, your brother. I tried to find you in Gehenna, but I was busy projecting my fears upon children or obsessing about people who speak with their mouths. I tried to find you in Gehenna, climbed branches of the trees of judgment from which I saw large animals setting fire to garbage, but no sign of you. I tried to find you in Gehenna, where they recruited me to shelve books of indignation, anger, tumult, confusion, and other volumes from the collection, and I am still shelving books. Where the angels like to name all the secret things with names only angels can pronounce. Amid supplicating and petitioning and righteousness and faith and elevator music, I tried to find you in Gehenna, but could not see through tears due to the loudness of monster trucks driving away the Satans. I tried to find you in Gehenna where secrets collect like ashes in great piles and feel air ducts of high-rise condominiums. Between long rows of animal pelts hanging beautifully like parted Wookiees, Behind a massive desk in an office of aquariums, stone carvings, and whale tusks. Breathing and sleep on the other bed in the Manhattan hotel room. Sleeping in my North Beach apartment windows, open California seals barking. Through pillars of smoke from the millions of cigarettes. Bidding at the auction of heavy chains leaning on the red angle like an armrest amidst smudged carbon on geofilm beside the seated figure hooded for interrogation and indistinct in outline. Laughing in complicity about the joyous absurdity of life's situations through the opaque carapace between us, 
eating pumpkin seeds and tossing the shells out the car window into the heaven, into the oven. Holding collapsible beach chairs as you make your way through hulks and husks toward the sea, I tried to find you in Gehenna, in your tiny space of worry, skating in the park at night with love and pine trees in the storehouse of hail, the storehouse of mist, the storehouse of clouds in the chambers of sun candies and moon cakes, where people speak of a day when mountains will leap like rams and all will become angel food cake in heaven, where memories become carbon paper before fire, in the valley pit diner across the street where we might go for tomato soup and crackers, in the deep valley where pixelated mouths are mute, where jaws chewing smoked meat sandwiches are covered with rough stones. I tried to find you in Gehenna, to talk to you as I talk to television and bathroom mirrors. I tried to find you in Gehenna, kneeling at the fireplace with iron poker, getting kings and powerful men burning again. I tried to find you in Gehenna to make sure you were getting your reprieve from ill treatment on a cool white patio. I tried to find you in Gehenna to know for sure you are no longer there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ruth, for the beautiful anthology, and congratulations to you and to everyone in the book.